Can you all hear me okay? Okay. All right, so I'm going to talk about finishing up the uh, transient lab and I'm going to introduce the new lab for you guys. Um, I did great. I'm, I'm in the process of grading the exam. It's probably going to take me a while to grade the exam because there's six problems on the exam as opposed to four. Even though you, you folks solve four, I, I have to grade six. Um, I did give you guys the key, and I was trying to hurry to give you guys the key, so of course when I hurry I make mistakes. So um, I will, there's like one or two corrections I have to make. Uh, on, well, I made them on the key, I just got to give them to you. Um, the, last multiple, the last conceptual question, um, I'm not going to grade the torque question because... Um, kind of an unfair question because the magnetic field really wasn't constant over the area of the the loop. So I'm just going to give uh, credit for every, to everybody for that one. Um, the first question was valid, just the, the uh, torque question was not. Okay, so I'm going to do that. I've graded a multiple choice and I've graded uh, problem number one. So I still got a ways to go. I'm hoping to be done by Monday. One of the things, um, one of the problems, um, well, I did something silly last week with the RLC lab or the RL lab. I did something silly last week when I derived one of the equations. Uh, let, me, let me just make my point, Jacob, and then I'll answer your question, okay? Um, I wrote this down the other day. Without thinking, I did it from memory. I made, made a mistake. Never shouldn't do things from memory. I wrote down that the voltage across the resistor is given by this expression for this circuit, and then I showed that you can solve for R or L. I'm sorry. I derived this. Well, this equation is wrong. This is actually the voltage across the inductor. Okay, the voltage across the resistor looks like this. So I should have used this equation in my derivation. Now, I'm still going to get the same answer, but really I should use this equation. Okay, and I noticed it during lecture because when I derived this in lecture, I realize that if I multiply by R, I get this. Okay, so I apologize for that. So in your derivation, use that. Okay, so Jacob, what was your question on number one? Um, so, for the key, you said that it was F. Um, so, for number one, an electron placed into a magnetic field points to the right. Uh, velocity of electron towards bottom of the page. Like this? Um, yeah. And so, um, and I did the whole right-hand rule thing, um, and I got... Uh, B that the uh, magnetic uh, no the force 
on it is directed out of the plane of the page, but the, you had on the key that it was F into the plane of the page. But isn't it an electron, not a positive charge? No. Huh? Right, the right hand rules for a positive charge. For an electron, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta flip the vector by 180 degrees. And that's what several people did on the, on the exam. They forgot that it was an electron. Okay. Thank okay. You. All right. Um, so hopefully, you know, note, this, note this for you guys for your derivation. So I'm going to talk about the last part of the transient lab where you put a capacitor in your circuit. Now, in our lab, we're not going to use a battery, but we're going to use the square pulse, because if you use a battery, um, what you're going to see in a scope is boring. Okay, so you need something to change all the time, so you're going to input a square pulse. Okay. And so... I need to do a little bit of math to describe the transient RLC circuit. You close the switch, the, system, the circuit will respond. How will it respond? Well, I have to do a little bit of work, and the group this morning got a little bit intimidated, but I was doing on the board, but I'm not doing anything. I'm not using any scale beyond what you've learned in order to solve this problem. So let me ask you this. If I close the switch, what can we say about the current at t equals zero and the current at t equals infinity? Actually, let me write it here. I'm going to need a lot of space, so I'm going to rewrite everything. You guys have seen this, so I'm going to erase it. I hook the switch up. What should I equal? What should the current be when t equals zero? And what should the current be at t equals infinity? When the capacitor is fully charged, what, how much current should I have in my circuit? When it's fully charged. Well, it should be zero. When you flip the switch and you uh, start and you uh, start the system, the inductor is not going to like to change, and so initially the current is going to be zero. And you know, you, you've done the lab that the capacitor charges and discharges exponentially. So if I want to look at the current as a function of time, I know it's going to be zero here, and I know it's going to be zero at infinity. So it's going to asymptotically approach zero at infinity somehow, like that. And maybe it'll do something like this. It's possible. This is one possibility. Okay. Or I can do something that, you know, it comes out really fast. Who knows? But we know solution will include an exponential.
Actually, I should say I will include some exponential. Does all that make sense? You guys there? Okay, I'm just going to continue then. If you guys have questions, stop me. Otherwise, I'm not stopping. Okay. What I want to do is determine I as a function of time. I'm going to apply Kirchhoff's laws. This is the name of the game. I want to find I as a function of time. And I have two approaches. I can write this in terms of Q, this in terms of Q, solve for Q, and then determine the derivative of Q. That gives me the current. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take the derivative. With respect to time, all the way across. The battery voltage is constant, so that gives me zero. I get that. Okay. Um, everything has a minus sign in it. I'm going to multiply through by negative one. Instead of me writing it out again, I'm going to, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to say this. I multiply through by negative 1. Then I'm going to divide everything by L. Oops. Oh, what's dq dt? dq dt is i. So I read everything in terms of I. This is called a second order, a homogeneous second order differential equation. I'm going to solve it. Yeah, I know you haven't had Math 33, but I'm going to solve it anyway. I'm not going to use the methods of Math 33. I'm going to use intuition. Okay? And this is where folks in the other class did not like this. I'm just using intuition. Where's my intuition come from? It comes from the fact that I know i t equals zero is zero, i t equals infinity equals zero, and then I know this is gonna have, my solution is gonna have some exponentials in it because I know how the capacitor charges up and, and, I, and I know how the current acts in a, in a RLL circuit. So I'm gonna say, let's guess that i of t is equal to this function. If I'm right, if, if my guess is good, then I should be able to get stuff out of here that makes sense. I'm just guessing that. I could have guessed a different function, but why guess a different function if it doesn't have any physical intuition associated with it? So I'm going to take this and substitute it into here.
What's nice about taking the derivative of the exponential is that you get this, the exponential back times a function, uh, times a constant, sorry. And so when I, when I do this, when I take the second derivative here, I'm going to get a omega squared e to the omega t. Uh, when I take the first derivative here, I'm going to get And then this is just going to give me so factor out and I'll get this. In order for this to always be true, independent of time, the thing in parentheses has to be zero. That always has to be true, because this is never zero. This has to be zero in order for this to be zero. So I use the quadratic formula to solve this. Which gives me omega equals And simplifying it, I get the following. So that's omega. So that means then that my solution looks like this. There's, there's two omegas, so that's good. Because I need two functions because I have to have two constants of integration. Solving a second order differential equation is like integrating twice. Okay, so I then is going to look like this. And then I'm going to factor out this term. So that's what my solution looks like. This is what the current looks like as a function of time. It looks like a complicated equation. The problem is, is that my solution depends on what happens under here. You can have the following.
So these are three possibilities for what can happen under the radical, and that's going to affect my solutions to my differential equation and make a big difference. So, so how I choose my R, my L, and my C in my circuit is going to affect what I'm going to get for my solution. I'll get, really, I'll get different functions. So, if suppose r over 2l squared is greater than 1 over lc. If that's the case, then everything under here is positive and everything under here is positive. You have a decaying exponential here. You have an exponential here and an exponential here. You have a decaying exponential function. And you get a solution that looks kind of like this. Of course, how, the, how fast this goes down depends on your values of R, L, and C. This is called overdamped. But what if r over 2l is less than 1 over lc? Which may happen, which is the case that you're going to be looking at for part 3 of the lab. What do we do in that case? What happens if this is negative. Well, I can always write it this way. What's the square root of negative one? Anybody know? Oh, your calculus teacher won't be happy if you don't know the square root of negative 1. It's i, okay. So, so basically then, if I rewrite my radicals like this, then my solution looks like this. What does that mean? What does it mean when my solutions look like that? Anybody? What, what does it mean when you have a complex exponential? Have you guys seen this before? Have you heard of Euler's formula? Have you seen this? Yes, no. You can derive it from expanding the exponential function. 
in a series. You can derive, you can derive this very easily. Okay. Well, anyway, my point is, um, this, these are exponent, these are just sine functions. Basically, this ends up being the following. And it doesn't matter whether I write sine or cosine here. So basically, I have a, a, a sine function or a trig function with a decaying exponential. And so, if I plot i as a function of t, well, that's not good. Hold on. It looks like that. As long as you satisfy th uh, this, this condition, you will get something that looks like this. So, in part three of the lab, you're going to look at this condition. This is called underdamped. This is the under Dan case. If you took 215, you, you've talked about, you actually look at the solutions of this differential equation at some point in 215. So this is the under damped case. And you're going to look at the under damped case. You will choose values of R, L, and C so that you can get something like that. But you're going to use a square way, right? So you're going to input square pulse. And look at voltage, uh, yeah, voltage across the resistor. Why am I saying that? Because the voltage divided by the resistance will give you the current. So whatever, so the voltage and the current are going to have the same shape across the resistor. So what will your data look like? What, what, what should you expect to get? You should, you should expect to get something that looks like this. I showed you this last week. But I will show it again. That's the wrong one. So you should get, you should get, these are some of the scope traces I did when I was playing around with the RLC circuit. So you're going to choose R, L, and C to get an underdamped. So when you look at the first two, nice underdamped signals and then the one on the bottom right is also is a great example of an under damp uh, circuit okay so your goal is to get a signal that looks like one of those that's all i need you i, I just need you to uh, look at the signal hit the hold button and then take a picture of that, just like I did, and put it in your lab report. Oh, all you can see is the Word document? Okay.
Okay, not sure what happened on your end, Nicholas. Let me make this smaller so you can see all of them better at the same time. Do you see all of them then? Yeah, there must have been some sort of delay or something. That's a, that, that was a zoom issue then. That's weird. Anyway, but the, look at the top two and the, and the, and the bottom uh, right one. That's what you're get, trying to get, okay? You will choose the frequency. You will choose R, L, and C so that you can observe that. And I can zoom in on one of these if you want. So you get a clear shot at what it looks like. Okay. Take a look at these two. So those are all fine. So if you get any one of those, that's fine. Just let me know what R, L, and C and the frequency are. Okay. Questions on that? That's all you got to do. It took me all that work to show you where this comes from. And in fact, let me show you a plot from in, my, in our PowerPoint notes. Give me a second to switch over. Do you see the PowerPoint slide? Okay. So this is a graph of really the solutions that I talked about. I didn't talk about the third solution yet. I will say something very quickly. But this is the graph of the current as a function of time for the RLC circuit. So let me say something about the third solution. The third solution, the third possibility, is that these two are equal to each other so that this exponent is zero. Now, when the exponent is zero, it becomes a problem. This is where we have to invoke the, the techniques of Math 33. It's really a trick. I mean, you don't have to know Math 33 to, to actually derive it. The, uh, the last case, but see, when this is zero, you basically have the same function. You need another, you need two terms in your function because when you're solving a differential equation, it's like integrating twice, you should get two constants of integration. Okay, so when you get a double valued solution. So you get something like this. Since this is zero, or since this term is zero, you're going to get but you need another solution. And you can look for the second solution using a simple trick. I'm not going to go through that, but I'm just going to say you can I'm just going to say you can show that the second solution looks like this. Okay. So when you take Math 33, you'll see where that comes from. I'm not going to prove that to you. It actually takes quite a bit of work. Um, more work than getting this. So this is called critically damped. And the system goes 
towards steady state in the shortest time period. So in the graph, that you see there, the black graph is the critically damped case. The red one is the underdamped, and the green one is the overdamped. You are going to be looking at the underdamped case. And these graphs are, are, you know, for particular values of R, L, and C. If you change the values of R, L, and C, the oscillations will change, etc. Questions on this so far? Concerns? Because you folks have been very quiet. Okay. Um, you could have questions on the lab. I haven't gotten much concern from you guys about what I did on the board than from the other class. The other class didn't like what I did. They had some objections to what I was doing, but you guys are okay with it, I'm guessing. But I didn't do any Math 33, really. I mean, I didn't explicitly uh, take anything that required Math 33. And when I had to, I would just say, it can be shown that, okay? Because I don't expect you to know Math 33. No questions, concerns? Okay, so I'm going to move on. Next lab, the last lab of the semester is the R, is, is a RLC lab. The equipment is almost exactly the same. Okay? The only thing different is going to be the resistor. We're going to be testing uh, in the RLC lab. Let's see if I get a better marker. This one's dying. We're going to be testing the equations we're going to get from chapter 33. So you're going to put in a sine function. And in this lab, we're going to try to, oops, sorry, I didn't change screen. Sorry about that. So this is the ACR, this is the ACRLC lab. And our goal is to, to study as much as we can from that circuit. We almost can study everything, but our oscilloscope doesn't allow it to. So the functionality of the oscilloscope is going to be minimal in this lab. And the reason why is because the oscilloscope only has one channel. You can only see one signal at a time. So we're going to make minimal use of the scope in this lab. If we were on campus, it would be a little different. You would be collecting a lot more data. Okay. So there's a lot to this lab because we're going to be measuring voltage across Oh, well, across this guy, across this guy, as a function of frequency. We're going to vary the frequency in the circuit, and we're going to be measuring voltages, we're going to be measuring currents, etc. Now, granted, we haven't talked about the physics of this circuit. We will on Tuesday. 
Okay, we will talk about the physics of this circuit on Tuesday. And then, hopefully next Thursday, what I'll be able to do is solve a second-order differential equation for this circuit. So you're going to see the solution to this circuit two different ways. Okay, you're going to see two different approaches to the solution to this. One of the approaches only works for the case where I have um, a sinusoidal varying function. Okay, so we're going to be looking at something called, an idea called phasers. And if you had 215, maybe Harris covered it. I'm not sure. Okay. So what I'm going to do, and I did this with the other group, just because we haven't covered the material, I'm going to write a series of steps for you. So at least you have this, and I'll probably email this to you, just because of the fact, um, with the other class, I didn't have very much time to go over this. But I, because of the fact that we're online, it's, I think it's better if I actually give you step-by-step -step instructions. Okay? Or fairly step-by-step -step instructions. So let's, let's, let's go over this. Let me see if I can get a better marker. All right, so first thing you want to do is wire the circuit. Remember, you're using AC, you're using sin sinusoidal function. And notice that this is a one ohm resistor. So I, I'm not going to use the second camera right now. This may be a little bit clunky. But I'm going to show you the one ohm resistor. It's, it's gray. Uh oh, something. Okay. You guys see the resistor? It's a one ohm resistor, it's gray. It's a gray, it has a gray body, okay? And you're using the same capacitor and inductor as, as the transient lab. Okay, so I want you to wire the circuit and in this lab, you will be using, the, you're going to have to use a 200 milliamp scale. So measure the resistance of the ammeter. And that's an AC scale. When you're measuring current in this lab, you're going to use a 200 milliamp scale the whole time. Don't use a 10 amp scale. Use the 200 milliamp scale. Do you know where the 200, where the AC is on this thing? This is the only multimeter you will be using in this lab. The little one is useless for this lab. Oh, is the picture frozen? Oh, it is. Hold on a second. Is it? How about now? Do you know where the AC is on here? It's orange. Good. So it's the orange one. Okay. 
We're measuring AC currents, we're measuring AC voltage. So you want to use the orange scale. You can only use this multimeter, the other one's useless. So that's what's going to make this lab a pain. Because when we're on campus, we use five of them at the same time. You have to be using one and you're going to be moving it from one component to the next. So that's going to make the lab very tedious. Okay, so yeah, it's, it's the orange scale, so everything's going to be AC, the sign for the function generator. I want to make sure you guys know this, because last semester my students were putting a square pulse in it, and they're getting garbage for data, especially with respect to the theory. Okay, so the next thing is, um, set the signal generator. to one volt, peak to peak. And use the scope to monitor a power supply, a signal generator voltage. throughout the experiment. You know what volt, one volt peak to peak is? So you're going to put in a signal that looks like this. The, si the, the function generator is going to produce this signal and you want this to be one volt. This is the peak to peak voltage. Not the amplitude, but the whole thing is one volt. And you may say, well, why, why did I choose that? And the reason why is because the darn function generator um, cannot drive enough current through your circuit. Because normally I would have you choose the voltage, actually, uh, as long as you, you keep it fixed. I, I, yeah, I can have you choose the voltage, but you can't with this function generator. It's too problematic. So we're setting it to one volt peak to peak. That will um, allow you, hopefully, to be able to do the experiment. If not, if it causes problems, you're gonna have to lower it, okay? This function generator does cause problems with this lab because it can't drive enough current. The currents are gonna be really low in this experiment. Okay, so this is what one volt peak to peak is. It's twice the amplitude. Okay. Like I said, I, you're, we're going to set it there at first, but if it doesn't work, you're going to lower it. Okay. So you're going to keep this throughout the same experiment. And one thing you might have discovered is as you vary the frequency in the signal generator, the, the actual voltage varies. Okay? So you have to monitor it. That's the only thing you're going to be doing with the scope in this lab is just to monitor the voltage across the scope. Don't use a digital readout. Just measure it by eye, the one volt peak to peak. Okay. Then place the ammeter in circuit. to measure the current. It's not current, as a, it's not, the, the meter is going to give you something to call some sort of average, it's called RMS. We'll discuss what RMS means later. Okay. Now, you turn on your signal generator, you have your signal generator on, and find the 
the frequency in which I is maximized. Okay, find a frequency in which I is maximized. In other words, vary the frequency and find a frequency where it's maximized. It'll look like if you plot I as a function of frequency for this circuit, it'll look like this. You want to find this point. This is called a resonance frequency. Okay. And you want to compare it because that's a theoretical value. Okay, you want to compare it to this expression, which is a theoretical value. Okay? You want to make sure you're close to that. It's going to be close. It's not going to be exactly the same value, okay? Next, um, find the smallest increment from the resonant, what we call the F res. that produces a milliamp, sorry. Find the smallest increment from this peak Vary the frequency and find the smallest increment that gives you a change of 0.05 to 0.08 milliamps. Okay. And this will be your step size. Remember, you're going, to be cal you're going to be measuring I as a function of frequency. And you're going to go from about 200 hertz to about 2,000 hertz. Okay, you're going to go from 200 hertz to 2,000 hertz. But you're not going to be going, I mean, what, what's your step size going to be? It's going to vary over this range. You want your step size to be smallest near the peak because you want to pin down the peak of your graph. And you want the step size to be largest far away. Okay. Okay. Now, if the signal is distorted at this frequency, make sure you look at the scope. If the if you don't get a uh, if, if your sine function gets distorted at this frequency, 
then you have to reduce this. That's the problem with the signal generator. So if the signal gets re uh, messed up at this frequency, make this smaller, make it like point, uh, 0.9 or point 0.8, and use point 0.9 or point 0.8 instead. So this is a ballpark value. When I did the experiment, this worked from my equipment. So I'm hoping it'll work for your equipment, but if it does not, you're gonna have to make this lower. Okay. Are we okay with this? Next step. Set signal generator. to 200 hertz. Measure and record I. Now here's the painful part. You gotta remove it from, you gotta remove the meter from the circuit. measure B sub L, B sub C, measuring V sub L is, V sub R is optional, but it would be good to do it just in case you need to troubleshoot, okay? Theoretically, theoretically, when you're at this frequency, these two are equal. But it won't happen, you won't see that in your case. Okay, it's, it'll be impossible to see that. By the way, make sure, one of the things you should uh, do in the experiment, make sure you measure the resistance of the inductor. Okay, I mean, you, will, you would have already done it in the, in the transient lab, but make sure you remember the resistance of the inductor, okay? All right, so once you've measured I and then the voltages, Then go back to the uh, replace the emitter in the circuit and change the frequency. And measure I. Then take the ammeter out and measure V sub L, V sub C, and etc. And do this
You're going to have to collect at least 25 to 30. The more, the better. 25 to 30 rows of data. Okay? You need that much data. Because what you're going to do, what you're going to do, like I said, you're going to end up plotting I as a function of omega. And the equation for this is very complicated. And so the more data you have, the better your curve fit will be. Okay? So you need at least 25 or 30 sets of data. So you're going to do this at 25 or 30 frequencies. All right? In that ballpark. So you're going to have a huge data table, which we're going to, and then we're going to calculate a bunch of stuff using, and we'll do everything in Excel. I'm going to show you next week how to use the spreadsheet to do all your calculations. Okay? So everything will be done in Excel to make life easier for you. Questions or concerns? So again, remember, you're, you're using the same capacitor and inductor as the transient lab. The only thing that's different is the resistor. It's going to be a one-ohm resistor, okay? You're going to be using a sine function instead of a uh, square pulse. You're going to only be using the scope to monitor the voltage across, uh, the voltage from the power supply. You want to make sure it stays the same value as you vary the frequency. And you can only use the big multimeter to measure your voltages and your currents. Because the other ones, the other one will not be will be useless for you. Okay. By the time we found that out, it was too late to order uh, two of these for you guys. Last semester. That's why. That's why you're stuck using one. Questions, concerns. I know everyone's tired. Everyone's getting tired at the end of this time of the year, right? No questions. So we're all okay. So if you have questions, I'm going to say refer to the video. Because I wrote everything on the board. And what I think what I'll do is I'll actually, uh, I wrote these up last night uh, for you guys. So that um, I think what I'll do is just email you this. My, they're just, they're just my, my notes, so hopefully you can read it. Okay. No questions? I guess we'll end it here. We'll see you too.